Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this pink panther. Like the cartoon? No, not at all. Well, I guess it is pink, so that's kind of like the cartoon. Anyway, this is the 35th scale SAS Land Rover Pink Panther from Tamiya, and this is a fairly old kit. I believe the tooling is from 1976, so it's well over 40 years old at this point. Being a Tamiya kit though, that doesn't quite fill me with dread like some other manufacturers might. Inside the box, you can see that not only are the sprues pretty good, but they're also pink. It's not quite the nice hot pink that I would choose, but it is a reasonable approximation of the colour that this thing is meant to be painted in. Most of the more recent Tamiya kits I've built are the 48th scale models, but I feel like they wouldn't be that different to compare with these old 35th scale sprues. I know I've mentioned this before about older Tamiya stuff, but it usually stands up pretty well. Everything here is pretty nice and neat and there were barely any mould lines at all. That's not to say it's perfect of course, and there were a couple of problems. Minor ones, but problems nonetheless. There's a few places where holes need to be drilled, and that's obviously not a problem in and of itself, but there's no indication that you need to drill anything. I guess that's really more of an instructions issue. There's also a couple of areas where the joints are a bit gappy and kind of ugly, and in prominent places, and I think that kind of thing would have been engineered out of modern kits. Not always, but probably. Overall though, the sprues are quite nice and neat and very easy to work with. The detail is rather good. It's not going to win any prizes for super detailing or anything, but out of the box it's pretty well detailed, and it doesn't look dated to me, which is the important thing. Even the crew figure looks pretty good. There's barely any flashing around the hands, which if you've built any figures you'll know that's a prime location for flash. I'm still not going to use him, but it's not because the figure is unusable, I just don't like humans. The instructions are about what I would expect. You get a set in English and German, and one in, I assume, Japanese. Things are reasonably well laid out and easy enough to understand and follow, though as I already mentioned, there's no indication where you need to drill holes for adding detail. Or maybe it is there and I'm just blind. It could also be that the holes are actually meant to be moulded into the parts, but just haven't been because of the age of the mould or something. Who can say? Maybe back in the 70s everybody just knew where to drill. Anyway, the instructions are decent enough and will be sufficient to get the kit built. Okay, enough of that, let's glue some plastic together. I start with the frame, which you see here. Gee, thanks Captain Obvious! I glue the front bumper into place here. There's a holder for the spare wheel and that should face upwards. There's also a rear bumper, which goes on the opposite end to the front bumper, if you can believe that. Onto that rear bumper, this towing hitch can be installed. This is another thing that you should probably install the right way up. You can use the engine detail on the underside of the frame, should you need a reference for which way is up. This engine, or transmission, related piece of doodaddery goes in here. And then we've got this drive shaft thing. This has a piece of frame that it should go through, that little bit that I dropped there. It seems easier to install both of these parts at the same time, rather than trying to kajigger the shaft through the hole in that frame thing. Next, I put together the front axles. The way the wheel holey things join onto the axles here is kind of interesting. The parts go onto the axle like so, and are then twisted into the correct orientation. It doesn't quite clip solidly in place, but it won't just fall off. You don't need to add glue, unless you want to, and you'll be able to position the front wheels however you like. To make sure both of the wheels point in roughly the same direction, this bar thing also clips into place and will stay there without glue. You will need to apply a little bit of pressure to clip this into place, and you should probably be careful with it, lest you break it. Now it's exhaust time. Oh boy, I love exhaust time! I'm sure you do. First we've got to add the muffler, which comes as two parts, and thanks to the keying, it's pretty simple to get this together. Why not follow that by installing the exhaust? This is pretty simple, there's some mounting pins for it, and you mount it onto said pins nice and easy. The rear axle comes next, and this is a simple single part that mounts right onto the appropriate mounting pins. You'll also need to nudge the drive shaft into place. Obviously you should do this after the exhaust, otherwise you'll probably have a painful experience trying to get that into place. 
The front axle comes next, and this goes into place just as easily as the rear one did, though I did have to fiddle with the drive shaft a bit more. Now we've got a nice looking frame ready for wheels. Instead of adding wheels, I attach these little, I don't know, are they steps? They go onto the rear bumper like so, simple enough. I didn't mean to tease you about the wheels just now, I know how excited some of you get about wheels, so let's put them together now. They're not especially difficult to assemble. You put the centre bit in, and it doesn't have any keying, which could be an issue, but if you're quick to put the inner tyre wall bit, I guess you might call it, it should help push the centre bit into, well, into the centre, so it shouldn't be a problem. There are different centre parts for the front and rear wheels, but the assembly is the same for both. There's also a spare wheel which has no centre part and a different outer part, and it's pretty easy to tell which one this is, so it's also pretty easy to avoid accidentally building it as one of the main wheels. We could install those wheels now, but I feel like they might get in the way of some of the other bits. So it's time to add more framey, detail-y bits like this thing that goes over the top of that round thing. There's another bit that goes across the frame slightly behind that one, and both of them are as simple to install as they look. Then it's time for suspension. The leaf springs and shock absorbers are a single part, which does help to simplify things a little bit. They're not too difficult to install, though you may need to apply some pressure to minimise gaps. The rear ones go on just as easily as the front ones do, and now I would say that we are ready for wheels. Instead, just kidding. The wheels are simple to install. The front ones have a little tab that links into the slot on the movable wheel holy bits, and once that's glued together, you won't be able to remove these parts from the axle without damaging it, so make sure that you actually want them on there. It shouldn't be too tricky to get all of this together and have everything movable. I wasn't that careful with the glue, so mine is going to be glued solidly in place, but that is what I wanted. The rear wheels are even more simple to put on. You just add glue and put them on. There is a little bit of play in these parts, so you may have to do a bit of nudging to get them nice and straight, but nothing too challenging. On the front bumper, we add these little rings. I assume these are for lifting the vehicle. They do require a little bit of nudging to make sure they're on nice and straight, but they're fairly simple to get right. Adding cab parts is next. Do we call it a cab? Whatever. I start with the bottom of the seats, which is what the instructions told me to do. You can see that there are guide holes, though maybe you can't see the corresponding pins. Even though you can't see them, they guide these parts into position nice and easily. This might be kind of unorthodox, but the next step is to add the seat backs. These are both different, but they're also both very easy to put on. I'm not quite sure why the passenger, or is it the gunner's side? I'm not sure why that's adjustable and the driver's seat isn't, but that's just the way it is, I suppose. The various gear sticks and other stick-shaped pieces of plastic go on next. They're all differently shaped, and it's fairly clear where each of these should go. I do like that the instructions tell us to put these on now, rather than later when there's a bunch of stuff in the way. It makes it a lot easier. Next, I start working on the front of the vehicle. The front grille part goes on pretty easily, but you can see the joint on the sides of the mudguard bit, I guess, aren't very good. I did scrape it with my knife a bit so it wasn't so bad, but I'll probably have to do some work with putty here later on. Next I add the dashboard part to the, I guess, firewall? The bit between the engine and the people. There are guides to help with positioning this, but there is still a bit of play to it. I tried to get this as centred as I could. Most ground vehicles have foot pedals as controls, and this one is no exception. These pedals are conveniently moulded as one piece, and this part simply slots into the opening in the wall. Then why not join that assembly to the front of the vehicle? You probably won't be surprised to learn that this goes together nice and easily. I follow that with this thing. It's got something to do with steering, and initially I did have some trouble figuring out where this should go. The instruction wasn't totally clear to me. Anyway, it goes here somewhere. I test fit this assembly on the frame just in case I was doing it wrong. Instead of installing that on the frame, I go back to adding details, like this thing. I'm not sure, but I think this is some sort of compass. It is a bit fiddly to get into place nice and straight, but like with the gears, it's probably a bit easier to do this now rather than when the rest of the vehicle is all together. 
the ability to steer is a function that most vehicles benefit from. So to facilitate this, I install the steering column. It connects up with that rectangular thing I wasn't sure about earlier. The steering wheel comes next, and this is probably just about as easy to install as it looks, because it was very easy to install and it looks easy to do. There's no engine detail here, so we might as well cover that hole up with the bonnet. It pretty much just drops right into place nice and neatly. The sides of the mudguard bit, whatever you want to call those, they go on next. They're not difficult to position, though this is another place we're probably going to have to use some putty. It's probably worth noting at this point that these parts need some holes drilled in them, and it would probably be a little bit easier to do that before gluing all of the parts together. I obviously didn't realise at this point because the instructions don't say anything about it, so I glued it all together and left it to bond. Then I add these little mounting plates which will hold the smoke grenade launchers, which I install next. I found these a little bit fiddly to get on at the correct angle, but they're close and that's good enough for me. There's one of these for either side, and I tried my best to get them at least lined up with each other. Here's where I learned that I would need to drill some holes in parts I'd already glued together. I didn't show myself doing it, but the way I figured where the holes should go for these first parts was by using a fine tipped marker pen and putting a black dot in the little guide holes on the inside of the part. The pink plastic is just see through enough that I could see the dots from the outside, and therefore could drill the holes from the outside, which is much easier than trying to do so from the inside. As you can probably see, it worked. I got the holes in the correct places, so they line up with the pins on these, I guess you would call them holsters? Whatever they are, I've installed them in what seems to be the correct place. Those weren't the only detail parts that needed holes drilled for them. For this, I assume bridging weight placard and light, I simply clipped the guide pins off, estimated their positions on the model, and glued them on. The marker pen trick just wouldn't have worked for these. Next, we have these headlamp lenses. These are obviously not clear, and I don't know if clear lenses were even a thing back in the 70s, but I don't suppose it really matters anyway. These parts pretty much drop right into place, though I did have to press them in a little bit, and they probably won't fall out, but I've added glue anyway, just to be sure. Also to avoid being smited by the glue god. Then I glue this license plate on, or I'm assuming it's a license plate anyway. It could just be a bunch of numbers and letters for funsies. This, I think it's a fire extinguisher, comes next. This is kind of an odd place for a fire extinguisher, if that's what it is, but that's where it goes, so that's where I put it. Side mirrors come next, and these aren't too difficult to install. There's a little block on both of them that connects to the vehicle itself. The one for the right hand side has a big rectangular thingamajig on it, which I'm sure has a purpose. Now, why not attach that front end assembly to the frame? There's keying for this, and it pretty much just drops right into place. Of course, our good friend Pressure makes a return to help eliminate any gaps. It makes perfect sense to assemble some jerry cans next. These are simple. We've just got to add some handles to the top of them, and that's not difficult at all. The trouble with these is the backside of them is open, and that can sort of be seen when they're installed on the model. If that kind of thing will upset you, I would suggest that now might be a good time to fill that cavity with putty or something. Now let's have a look at the rear tray section of the Land Rover. First I add this, which looks like it might be the tops of some fuel tanks or maybe some sort of box. Extra fuel tanks makes sense to me. The part pretty much just drops right into place. Then it seemed like a good idea to add the side parts. This will greatly improve the appearance of the rear section, and it's easy to do. You might have to apply some pressure, but I'm sure that's not too much of a challenge. I follow this with a big surprise. The tailgate. That's not a surprise at all! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Again, a little pressure might be needed here, but nothing too extreme. Attaching that assembly to the frame is a pretty obvious next step, so that's what I do. There's a few contact points where you can add the glorious bonding liquid. Praise the glue god. It really makes things look like they're coming together, and they are, but we're not done yet. Next, I add the jerry cans here beside the seats, and you can probably see what I was talking about with the holes in the back of those jerry cans being visible. I suppose they would be a lot less visible if you were going to include a crew, and I'm not, 
but I'm also not overly worried about this. I'm sure they could still be filled in with a bit of putty, it would just be a bit more challenging in the position they're in. Next, I add these little brackets to the side of the body. These mount into the obvious slots on the sides of the body. Their purpose is to hold the, I don't know what you call them, the little ramp thingies to use if the vehicle got stuck, and we'll see those later. I didn't want to put those on until after the glue on the brackets was set. You know, just so they would stay there while I kajiggered the ramp things into place. On the left side, just behind the gunner's seat, I add this. Again, I think it's a fire extinguisher, but I could obviously be wrong. The important thing is that I've put it where the instructions want it. Between the two front seats, I add this set of boxes. They look like ammo boxes and that's probably what they are, for the convenience of the gunner. Then I install some smoke launchers. These are pretty much exactly the same as the ones on the front, only they're on the rear. Next, it's time to make a tripod. I'm not really sure what this is for, either a gun or some sort of binoculars, or maybe it's to hold a camera to take some nice steady pictures. It seems like the sort of thing a recon vehicle might do. This was kind of fiddly to do, but eventually I managed to get all three legs glued together on the central bit, whatever that's called. This is another thing that, had I known, I would have drilled mounting holes for. Instead of drilling though, I just cut the mounting pins off and glue it into place roughly where the instructions say it should be. I'm sure it won't hurt if it's a millimetre or two out of place. But Herbert, it needs to be exactly precise for... I think this next thing is a radio. It consists of two parts that are glued together like so. It can then be mounted on the little tab between the two front seats above the ammo box. Simple enough. On the rear, I add this piece of covered stowage. This has a particular way that it should go on, and you can visually tell if you've got it wrong, though I found it didn't quite sit perfectly even when correctly installed, so I had to hold it there while the parts that were making contact bonded. Next, I add this rear-facing chair, presumably for the gunner that will operate the gun that we'll install here later on. And here's the mount for the forward gun. I did have to use a little bit of force to get this to go all the way through the dashboard, and I'm pretty sure the pole should go all the way to the floor. And if not, well, I guess it's wrong and somebody's gonna yell at me. Moving on, now is the time for shovels. And these have mounting pins, but surprise surprise, no corresponding holes. Again, instead of drilling the holes, I simply cut the mounting pins off. Then I estimate the position and glue the first shovel on. The second shovel just plops into place on top of that. I can't remember if there was meant to be a mounting hole for this pickaxe head, but it goes here, and its handle goes on top of the gun holster thing next to it. Just in front of where the windshield would be, if there was a windshield, I put this roll. Maybe it's a tarp for covering the vehicle. Whatever it is, it goes here, and because there's no guides, you could put this on either way. I chose the side with less of a gap to be facing forward. It just looked better that way. At the rear, there's a set of chains to hold the stowage thing up, and to be honest, they're not the best looking chains, and if you really wanted, I'm sure that you could find some appropriate sized chain to replace this with. I obviously didn't, but it's an idea. And now, because why not, I attach the ramp things. I was a little bit confused as to how these go on at first, but it's pretty simple once you realise that the hook bit goes through the middle holes in the ramp and not the top ones. Would you look at the clock? It's time to make guns. I glue together these two parts, which seem to be some sort of trigger and handle mechanism. I don't know anything about how these guns work, which I'm sure is very surprising to you all, but I guess this trigger assembly makes the gun easier to use on a mount or something like that. However it works, this assembly is glued onto the bottom of the gun here like so. And then we add this box. I have no idea what this is or what it does, but it's not too difficult to place thanks to the mounting tab. The reason I don't think this is an ammo box is because an ammo box goes onto this gun next, and it's pretty easy to get this into position. There are two of these guns and they're mostly the same and go together in the same way, but only one of them has the ammo box attached to it. Now I build the mount for the rear gun. These two parts go together nice and easy, like so. And then the other half of the mount goes on. This does go together easily, but then I remembered the gun, which needs to be sandwiched between the holdy bits at the top of the mount, and it's kind of fiddly to do that, especially if you want to leave the gun movable. 
The forward gun's mount is already on the vehicle, so we just need to sandwich the gun between the two upper bits of said mount. This is also a little bit fiddly, but not too bad. Once that assembly is together, the forward gun can be mounted on its pole. You can probably face this just about any direction you like, but I've chosen forward. The rear gun mounts in the rear. Oh wow, really? Yeah, really. You may need to nudge this so that it's standing nice and vertical, and maybe hold it there for a bit, because the gun's weight kind of makes it want to flop over. Next comes this, I think it's a searchlight. There's a handle looking thing that you need to install on the back of it, and then it goes on the left side of the rear of the Land Rover like so. On top of the front left gun holster, I add this thing, which is probably some sort of pry bar or something. It was probably meant to go on a bit earlier, but better late than never, right? And finally, the spare wheel. This simply plops into place on the mount for it on the front bumper. There is a kind of depression on the bonnet that I would have assumed is for a spare wheel, and maybe it is, but maybe it was moved to where it is now to reduce the vehicle's height, maybe for air transport or something like that. What matters to me is I think it looks a bit more interesting where it is. Anyway, that's it. The Tamiya 35th scale SAS Pink Panther Land Rover in a nice pink plastic is completed. It does seem kind of unusual that this is moulded in pink, but something I like about it is that if you've got a dark grey floor, like I do, if you drop any of the parts, you should be able to find them a little bit easier than grey parts, so that's nice. Also it's just kind of fun, isn't it? Though it did make lighting this a bit of a challenge at times, which isn't fun. I guess really it doesn't matter that much, it's not a selling point, and I probably don't need to be talking about it so much, so maybe I'll stop. I'm pretty happy with how this has turned out. I mean, it's not surprising. I have built older Tamiya stuff before. Not a lot, but some. And this model may be from the 70s, but I would say that it stands up to a lot of modern stuff pretty well. The detailing is fairly good, and I feel like if you were into upgrading kits with aftermarket stuff and things like that, this would be a good base for that kind of thing. Not only is it a good solid kit that goes together nice and easily, and looks pretty good, it's also cheap. I don't remember how much I paid for this one, it's been in my stash for quite a while, but I've seen this kit and kits like it for about $20 Australian. That's not too bad at all. I would suggest that this might be a reasonable kit for a beginner, though the lack of instruction around holes that need to be drilled could be an issue. Drilling holes, or removing the mounting pins and estimating positions of parts isn't the most complex thing to do, it just might not occur to a beginner, but I guess that's one of the reasons I do these videos. I'm not planning on starting to paint this right away, but I am kind of tempted to do it, mostly because I like pink. This would be the first time for me painting something pink that is actually meant to be pink, but I'm sure some dingling would probably still get upset by it. Maybe I should paint it green. Anyway, I've probably waffled enough for now. If you've got any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment section below. If you want to watch me build kits like this one live on stream, head on over to my Twitch channel, which is where I happen to stream. You'll find the link in the description below. And if you haven't already done so, why not subscribe here on YouTube for the low low price of absolutely nothing, I guess except for the energy it costs you to click the subscribe button. Or maybe if you've got the means and you want to help a herba derp -a -derp do herba derp -a -derp things and see my videos a bit early without any ads, consider becoming a patron. You can find links to Patreon and all of my other things like Discord and social media in the description below. And as always, I shall return soon. So until then, be excellent to each other, have an amazing day, and thanks for watching. Farewell.